ask Jill to check the live stream. Oh, I saw the, the baby formula. That's pretty awesome. I gave some to Diane. Cool. I didn't know that. So we got all kinds of things to say thank you for. And they're all in date. So, yeah, yeah, so I on. Put them on your shelf. The ones right. that were just recently expired, I put out with the expired books. Right. Yeah, so we got 217 boxes of food from the mission on Tuesday. We got 60 chickens from the mission today. We got a large donation of baby formula, right? We also were told that we're gonna be getting um, several cases of food donated from PSE and G. So it has been a really amazing three days. <laughs> Trudy's on with us, hello Trudy. Well, that's barbecue food. All right, Jill and the kids are there. Hello, Jill and the children. So, all right, you guys get to pick. Are we going to do international prayer requests first or local prayer requests? International. International. All right. So tonight, oh, Diane's on with us as well. Hello, Diane. Tonight, we are praying for the nation of Mexico. So some of you... Has anybody here been to Mexico? Yeah. Two of you? Okay. All right. So a couple people have been to Mexico. Jill has been to Mexico. She um, she actually did a long-term mission trip there. That's where she got her passion for Spanish, I think. Jill said me. It came, it, but it comes like a minute late. Yeah. So Jill has been to Mexico. Well, she was there. Jill, how long were you in Mexico for? I'll give her a second to answer. Um, I see a Sloan there. Hello, Sloans. I'm guessing that's just Charlene because I think Daryl is on a boat somewhere right now. He picked a good week to go. He missed all the smoke. Well, it needs some rain. I know. From what, the big fire down here? This is from Canada. This is coming down from Canada. El Nino. Yeah, so the jet stream is doing this weird little hiccup right now where it's going up into Canada and then back down the East Coast. That's why it's not super hot right now, but it's bringing all that smoke with it. So today, New York City was the um, worst air of any large city in the world. Wow. Worse than Beijing, worse than, worse than anywhere. Yeah, they have the Oh, my friend Owen White just got on. Well, hello, Pastor Owen. He says, greetings to you and the Penzo family. Well, greetings to you too, brother. Glad you could join us. Isn't there a fire in the Pine Barrens or something? Yeah, there, there are a few fires just a little bit north of here. And then there's also a fire over in Ocean County. Um, and I don't think any of them are out, but they are... Um, getting better Containment. yeah so the one in Ocean County was only 70 acres I think they said the one north just north of Deptford I think was like 500 acres yeah oh Jane's on too well hello Jane and uh, you're very welcome we've got um, Edgar's birthday today so happy birthday Edgar I got to give him a birthday hug so, you know, he is home. So when you leave tonight, you're not going to store him a birthday hug. I saw him a couple times today. Yeah? Did you get a hug? I got two hugs. I gave him one. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I got two hugs. So I don't, I don't know how he felt, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, anyway. Back to Mexico. So... Mexico is one of the earliest areas of missions focus for the Church of the Nazarene. This is one of the places where we had churches sending missionaries before we were officially finished organizing as a denomination. So we've had missionaries in Mexico longer than we've been the Church of the Nazarene, which 
which is pretty cool, I think, yeah. So you probably all know where Mexico is, it's below Texas, right? Um, so Mexico is one of the earliest areas of missions focused for the Church of Nazarene. In 1903, the Church of the Nazarene began to establish churches in Mexico. Once the center of the ancient Aztec Empire, through Spanish conquest and the spread of smallpox during the 16th century, the power and population of Mexico was decimated. Ultimately, Mexico received its independence from Spain in 1821, and in the 19th century, lost its northern territories to the United States. So, in the... Um, in the 1500s, that's when the Spanish conquistadors first arrived, looking for gold. Um, and when they came, as it says, not only was there great violence against the Aztec people, um, disease also ran rampant. Smallpox was the big one. It was something that a lot of the Europeans had some level of resistance to, but the locals had never been exposed to it. So quite a bit of destruction. They never found the Aztec gold. No, I mean, they did have a lot of gold, but they never found El Dorado. And um, they let the gold make them very greedy. Mm -hmm. And they murdered thousands of people in order to steal that gold. So it's a, a very dark time in history. And as, as you've seen, a lot of the places around the world, that time period, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, um, this was a time when colonialism was really running rampant and you had a few different European superpowers that were trying to divvy up the globe and they often were not kind to the people they were taking over. So um, much of the genetic population of Mexico is closer related to people from Spain than they are people who were Aztec. Although you do still find Aztec and Mayan people. Um, so just something to remember. Today, Mexico, is, Mexico City is considered one of the great megacities of the Western Hemisphere with a population of 22.2 million people. Wow. That's like 8% of the U.S. population, like in one city. Isn't that crazy? 22.2 million people living within the metropolitan area. Mexico has often struggled with revolution and unrest and has in recent years been the crossroads of refugees trying to find their way north. So people from other countries in South America trying to get to the United States, cutting through Mexico. Um, I'm sure you've also heard that there's been a great deal of violence in the last, I don't know, 50 or 60 years because of um, drug cartels. Mm -hmm. um, in the 80s, you know, it was uh, cocaine was really the big thing. Now it's getting into other things, but again, people seeking riches and preying on the population in order to get wealthy. So in both of those cases, we're seeing the kinds of things that greed can do. Um, okay, so. As you will read about refugees, these refugees and dispossessed persons from countries to their south have struggled not only with the journey, but also with the disease and disillusionment of migration. Yet, Nazarenes in Mexico have welcomed those who were suffering and those who sought to mitigate that suffering with the compassionate touch of Jesus. Which, you know, I try not to get too political in these, although we're talking about colonialism, and that's a little bit political, I guess, even though it's hundreds of years ago. But their response to the refugee crisis is to help people who are hurting. And that is the Christian response. When we, as children of Christ, encounter people who are suffering, that's our required response. Doesn't matter where a person's from, or what color their skin is, or what language they speak, or what political affiliation they have. If someone's hurting, we help. Um, yeah, I'll get off my soapbox here now, but thanks for that moment. Yeah, really. um, so the Church of the Nazarene in Mexico has 79,988 members. 
there are 692 fully organized churches and 213 not yet organized churches. There are 399 district licensed and 498 ordained ministers on 15 districts. Um, two of the prayer requests they ask us. Oh, everybody's blessed. Bless us all. Um, they ask for prayer for their pastors, some of whom have been affected by economic problems, illnesses, and discouragement. Bless you again. You get one more, and then we're going to ask you to sit out. Uh, you want to see sneezing, you should see Bethany. Every Sunday morning when she walks in, she walks in the building and sneezes about a dozen times. I don't know what it is. So, they ask for prayer for pastors. Um, pray for these and all pastors who are seeking to lead their churches in spiritual growth. Their testimony is this. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's Romans 8.37. They also ask for prayer for new generations, that God will raise up the necessary leadership for the growth of his work. There are still churches without a pastor and committed people are needed who have a call to serve God through evangelism and discipleship, bringing people to Christ. And some praises. They thank God that throughout the pandemic, from our southern and northern borders, God has helped us to provide support to undocumented immigrants with food, clothing, and other basic needs. The Church of the Nazarene, together with Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, provide support. There are exciting reports of evangelism taking place in the centers where this work is ongoing. And they also ask for another praise. We thank God for our leaders and for the resources provided by the Church of the Nazarene, including an emphasis on mentoring. District teams have been formed that train and motivate leaders to mentor others. Um, they make a note here of a new program they're going to be starting as um, a companion to this newsletter. They're calling it Kids Kaleidoscope, and it's going to be resources and materials for children that will help them understand missions. So um, it's a, a link that you can click on in the email. So, of course, that doesn't work for us right now in this room because I'm talking to you about it. But if you do subscribe, you can click through and get resources for kids. Um, they also wanted to share a testimony about the Nazarene Medical Corps. Um, this is one story that happened in September. Um, a Nazarene Medical Corps provided more than 600 medical consultations to the migrant community on the southern Mexican border area of Tapachula, Chiapas. They also led a special time for more than 50 children who heard the message of the gospel. The Corps mobilized from September 24th to 26th during the COVID-19 pandemic and attended to people from Haiti, Central America, and South America. Among the most frequent conditions they encountered were gastrointestinal issues, headaches, chronic diseases, dermatitis, cavities and dental pain, muscle pain, and of course, emotional pain. The volunteer health professionals, in great part, are young and from the South, from Sierra, South Pacific, and the Southern Border Districts, and include general medical doctors, nurses, radiologists, physical therapists, and psychologists. Dr. Aparicio from the Corps said that one mother, originally from El Salvador, came to them worried about the health of her daughter, who had symptoms such as diarrhea, fever, and weight loss. While the doctor was assessing this young patient, she gave her diagnosis, medications, and also shared the message of faith and hope in Jesus Christ. During this time of serving, the team noticed the presence of many children in the nearby park, and they invited them to play games and sing children's songs. This allowed them to present the message of Jesus Christ to pray with them and to identify various emotional problems. It was a beautiful time, said Edie Montejo of Nazarene Compassionate Ministries in Mexico. The word of God is declared in Mark 9, 41. It says, Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward, said Monteo. Everyone can help. We can motivate the churches of the Nazarene around the world to serve with love, respect, and grace 
to participate with sincerity in local Nazarene compassionate ministries. This is what it means to live the practical holiness of God. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but of course, um, that's why we do the food pantry, right? That's why we're going out to places. That's why we're going to Village Arms and Pensacola Towers and Ken Avenue Apartments. What was that verse in Mark? That was Mark 941. So, good stories, good good testimonies, and I think we're hearing. I, I want to say how to say this. This is not a brand new idea, right? right? This is following the model of Jesus, to go to people, to be with them, to help them with their needs, to to respect them and love them as equals, and especially to care for people whose society is looking down on them. You know, think about this mother from El Salvador. They've had some terrible um, war conditions, terrible violence. And to flee violence in El Salvador, and then to try to get through Mexico, to be sick, to be with your kid, to try to cross another border, to be locked up or deported. or It's a terrible journey. You know, and, and people are doing this because they're desperate. And we need to have compassion. I don't know all the answers about rules, about who can be a citizen and all that. I just know we have a lot, and if people need help, we should help them. So, I know that can sound a little idealistic, but it's not that complicated. That's why he provided so much for that Jesus pantry. Well, it happens I mean, pretty much every month now for the past year. We've had a pantry day and distributions, and we had more people than ever before, and we gave out more than ever before, and then God gives us even more than the time before, and then we give it all away. And then he gives us even more, and then we give it all away. And it just keeps happening that God is making sure that we are provided for to give out this food. And of course, we're not just giving food. Amen. I feel sad once in a while, but I'm getting there. Well, I understand when you see 200 boxes and they got to be sorted and packed, and that's a, it's a lot of work. And no jelly. Yeah. But listen, PSC and G is sending us jelly. So when you pay your electric bill this month, just know part of it is going to send jelly to our food pantry. Well, that's Atlantic There's City. jelly in Oh, you're Atlantic that. City Electric? There's, okay. There's jelly in that. Well, they buy their, they buy their electric. PSC and G runs the nuclear power plant. Yeah. So even though Atlantic City Electric is your bill, they're buying the electric from them. So it's Jelly Electric. That's what we're going to call it. Okay. So we've got um, some updates here. I want to read some prayer requests. Um, let's see. Of course, we've got Edgar's birthday, um, and then. Every time somebody posts a new one, it jumps. Venus took her dog to the vet. They said that her leg is not broken, that they believe it came out of the socket when she fell, but it has gone back in. Great. So she said, thank you for all the prayers for her and Jeremy and Molly. Um, and she said, thanks be to God for getting her through this. So you, you might remember that um, Venus had to put her other dog, Thor, down about a month ago. So to have Molly be injured and possibly facing something like that, it was very, very frightening. So thank God that, um, that Molly's on the mend. Jeanette asked for an unspoken prayer request, prayers for our world and the children, and prayers for the fires that are going on. So here I am telling the prayer requests, and I'm not writing them all down. So would you guys have any prayer requests you would like to share? Yes, yeah, you feel unspoken. Okay, Darlene's unspoken. Okay. 
Cal, did you? Yes, come on, Bell. Prayed for him Sunday night, right? <clears throat> now I gotta look because I'm pretty sure I've been praying for him. Yeah. So Courtney is the wife. Yeah. There it is. Courtney Bell. Okay. And you said they have three small children too. Yeah. Okay, and what was the other one you were saying? Marty and Fred. Yep, so I got to talk to Marty again. Um, he's a little discouraged. He's not really enjoying being in the hospital, which I think you can probably understand that. Um, he is on the mend. It does look like he's going to be going to a rehab facility, but he was still at, um, I didn't get to talk to him today, but yesterday he was still in Christiana. So it looks like they're going to, maybe put him, I guess Christiana has a subacute rehab attached to the hospital there in Delaware. Yeah. So it sounds like the first step is kind of a step down from the hospital to that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once they get him current along. Um, but yeah, please pray for Marty and Faye. Who else might have one? Sister. Okay, I'm ready. Pray for Pastor Paul and his family. <laughs> Thank you. All the ministries, all the churches, and I just want to read this scripture that was part of the prayer. It's titled, The Importance of Watching. But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing of this life and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. And so I just wanted to read that because I keep hearing uh, during the gospel shows that I'm watching that the church got to stand up and the church, you know, the sick got to come to us and we got to lay hands and we got to do got to stay prayed up so it's an opportunity to be able to come in here and listen to you teach but we got to stay prayed up amen and i wanted to it's it's very important it's crucial yeah that we pray without the heart the knowledge doesn't do anything even the devil knows the bible yes yeah you're right sister yes. you are very right well thank you very much for your prayers we appreciate it i'm going to praise you on this Friday. Okay. I usually don't ask much of God no more. We ask a lot of him in the church. And not all the times where our prayers get answered. But Monday night was the choice first. Yeah. Was on the album on Monday. And as everybody here in this church knows, and I know maybe a lot of people on Facebook don't know, that boy went through a lot. Yeah, yeah, because they got him on dialysis, and his port got infected, and he had a bumpy road. And he's due to get his kidney transplant. In August, right? In August. Yeah. Yep. It's coming. Yeah. That is a wonderful thing to celebrate. Yeah. I can't visualize an adult kidney being pulled through a very small bladder. Yeah, uh, I guess they put butter on it or something and just... <laughs> No, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure how all that works. I'm not a surgeon. But uh, I know that part of the waiting for the surgery was that his body had to get bigger. So, But I imagine you put one adult kidney in a one-year-old, and that thing's going to be supercharged. Yeah. yeah. He'll be like a little hot rod. I know that they have procedures where they move certain organs around. Sure, they wouldn't have scheduled 
Well, things do have some room to move around. Think about when you eat a large pizza, that fits in there somewhere, so. He was born without kidneys. Oh, wow. no. he, was born, he was born with two kidneys, but one wasn't functioning, so they took it out. Yeah. Right, okay. That's and right. I remember that. They did go in and take it out. And the other one, they're, they're doing dialysis. Yeah, because so with adults, I don't think they always do that. I think with adults, they leave they the old one in, right? Moving that away, yeah. 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 So it's, it's like putting the, the working TV on top of the non-working TV, right? Yeah. The surgeon's got it. I think they've got it covered, but that's wonderful news. A yes. uh, couple from the church. Barbara has been asking for prayer for one of her neighbors. Uh, we talked about him last week. He needs a liver transplant, but also has a partial blockage in a blood vessel by his heart. Mm -hmm. They decided that they wanted to repair the blockage before they attempt the transplant. So they are going to be working on that um, on the 28th. So later this month, they're going to do the, the heart catheterization and, and all that for the blockage. So please pray for Barbara's neighbor. We also want to keep praying for her eye. She's had low pressure in her eye. She's had a couple surgeries, and she's going to have to go back and get checked soon to see how that's doing. And uh, we're praying that her vision will be preserved and that she won't need more surgery. Well, I'm very thankful. Yeah, yeah. So that's another thing that happened. Maybe since we had one of these prayer meetings, that we picked up some another Wawa that we're getting food from. Logan Township. Yeah, up in Logan Township. So we're gonna we're getting food from Pennzoil and from Logan Township now. So, but that was kind of one of the deals. We wanted to say yes, but we needed somebody to handle the pickup. So thankfully, Barb was able to do that. Now, is all that stuff going directly to one of the uh, retirement houses? It depends or? on the timing. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that if it's the first three weeks of the month, it's going to go directly to our right. community drop-off. But if it's the week of pantry, we're going to try to hold as much as we can in our freezer and give it out on pantry day. Okay. So that way everybody gets some. Yep. So mm -hmm. that just means we need more freezer space. So we're getting very close to the target amount for our fundraiser for the pantry, yeah. So it's going to happen very soon. Um, if we go with one of the lower cost bids, we might already have enough. But I think we're, I don't think we're going to want to go cheap. So I think we need a couple more thousand and then we'll be all squared away. Um, let's see, Kay asked for a couple of prayer requests. She asked us to Please pray for her friend, Patty. She had a doctor's appointment last week and got another medical diagnosis um, concerning, she, she had been, she's had shortness of breath and they were having trouble finding out why. And they think it might be involving her heart. Um, please pray for, Kay said one of her cousins is having kidney stones removed. Um, let's see, we already talked about Molly. Um, let's keep praying for Jane's son and his girlfriend. His girlfriend is looking for new work that would help her to um, have a healthy workplace, a healthy work environment. And we know that's always very important. Um, Gina mentioned the fires. So, of course, we're praying for the homes that are near these fires, but especially our firefighters, because even when there's no homes, we still people are, are risking their lives to to stop and contain these fires. <coughs> yes. And I got to talk to him a little bit this week. Yeah. yeah. So let's keep praying for him. Uh, Jill started her new job. So she had a few hiccups today. New Marshall. I told her to wear the badge, but she said she's going to save that for Sunday nights. <laughs> But yeah, there were, they had all kinds of computer problems today because they were, so I guess HR, instead of putting her job in as a transfer, they put it in as a termination. So she was partway through the morning training the person who's replacing her 
and all of a sudden she got locked out of all the software and couldn't log onto her computer. And so she spent a lot of the day back and forth with the tech people getting all that rolling again. Yeah, and also please keep praying for the patient that she's been visiting. She spent some more time with him today. Um, he was not awake today, so it's been about two and a half days since he's been awake. So that means it's also been two and a half days since he's had anything to drink. So his blood pressure is going down each day as he's getting more dehydrated. So there's a good chance he's not going to wake up again. But um, Jill's visiting him and praying with him. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that she knows she spent every moment she could with him while he could still yeah. communicate with her. Yeah, but she spent extra time with him today knowing that we're going to be out of town. Did? Yeah. I didn't know that. He was totally out of it. I mean, nothing was going his way. And he wanted to come over here to help with the boxes and everything. Just things just weren't set right with him. So, like you said, it's a comfort for him that he knows everything would be all right trying to make sure everything went. Well, I think many of us have encountered this that. The more we try to give our hearts to Jesus, the more the enemy tries to put things in our path that trip us up. Yes. Yeah. And his work environment is one of those places where well, he's the getting devil, attacked. The devil knows that he wants to join the church and, mm -hmm. and he's learning. He's talking about things. Rich? Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, he, he works at the VA out, up in Philly. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there have been some bumpy things going on with some coworkers, and there was a, a mess where one of the coworkers got accused of sexual harassment, and it kind of made everybody take sides, and there was a lot of drama, and um, just you know, messes, people, people, yeah. And he's got a tender heart, so he when these kinds of things happen, he feels them deep. Well, he worked kind of out with the other trade. He worked out in the office. So. Well, I'll have to reach out to him again. <clears throat> yeah. We're lucky to have him with us. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take one last peek here through. Um, Daryl is traveling home on Friday, along with Charlene's mom. I would just call her Charlene's mom. <laughs> I feel weird calling her so much. Um, anything else before we go into prayer? Do you have anything? Me? Yeah, well, I know your, well, your, your knee's been hurting you yeah, a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, when you said, you were talking about pension care, and you said organizing Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? That's a very good question. So basically, a not yet organized church, I guess you could call it a baby church. Um, the, the word we use a lot in America is a church plant. So basically, um, in a mission field, first you would have a missionary going into an area to start the work. So there would be no churches in the country and a missionary would come in from somewhere and start working to build a church. In the very beginnings, it's not going to be a fully functioning church, right? When that's first starting, you don't have a pastor and a church board and all that kind of stuff. So that would be a not yet organized church. And usually that's either overseen by a missionary or as things grow, another church. So they sometimes call it a mother church and a daughter church. So for instance, this church, the Pennsville church, um, I don't remember the year, 
but Jim Sullivan and a few other people from this church helped plant the Vineland Church. And so in the very beginning there, this church was supporting those people starting a new church. I think so, it was early 80s. Early 80s, that sounds right. Yeah. Because I think Gates came back in like 88 or something like that, 89. And that's where they went when they came back from Africa. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, so you have like the mother church and the daughter church, and it's not yet organized. But then once it becomes fully functional, independent, then it's an organized church. Yep. And the same thing happens for districts. There are growth levels of districts that when you, when you have a missionary first go in, you don't have a fully functioning district. Um, but the goal is to work up to that point. Yep. Yeah. And then the district licensed and the ordained pastors. So um, an ordained pastor, like I'm ordained, so you're, you're done the process, right? If you're district licensed, that means you're still in your process of education and training. You are a pastor, but you have certain requirements to be um, interviewed and meet certain um, goals each year in your education and in your learning and in your ministry. And that gets renewed every year. You have to keep working at it. And then once you're ordained, then they kick you out and they don't check on you quite as often. Is Jim the gate of this weekend? He is doing a few different things. I know he's helping out at the media church, but he's also doing some preaching at a couple of United Methodist churches. What's your name? Okay. You got all these kids? Uh, We can figure it out. Okay. Yeah. Um, That was the last I heard. Um, he's one of those people that I don't think will ever retire. No. So he's always keeping himself busy. Yep. All right. Any other questions before we go to prayer? You're not retiring either. <laughs> nope. Well, the, that's the joke with pastors. You don't retire. You just stop getting paid. <laughs> But there's always work in the kingdom, and there's a place for every person. Whatever gifts or strengths or resources we have, we use them to care for each other. Amen. And sometimes God gives us a trailer so we can use that. (laughs) Yeah. Gary knows. I know. People know. Yep. Okay. Well, let's pray. Father God, thank you for smiles. Thank you for a chance to marvel at your work, to share of your grace and your love and your care. Father, thank you for the stories we have in this room, and thank you for the stories we get to read about from around the world. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Mexico right now. We thank you for the work that is happening there. Um, We lift up the volunteers with the the medical corps who care for physical and emotional ailments. We thank you for the Compassionate Ministries volunteers and leadership who are able to give food and clothing to people who need it. Um, Father, we lift up the requests of our brothers and sisters in Mexico for pastors who are affected by economic problems and illnesses and discouragement. Father, we pray that they would be lifted up and that they would be able to stand on that promise from Romans 8, that we are more than conquerors, that it's no matter what, Father, we are yours. And uh, we pray for the upcoming generations in the church in Mexico, that you would continue to raise up leadership for the growth of the work there, that the churches without pastors would have shepherds called to those congregations and that you would help train and raise up and prepare those leaders. Um, Father, we praise you for the work there during the pandemic, that you help the people in Mexico and also especially the, um, the immigrants who were coming through from many different places, from Haiti and from Central and South America. Um, Father, thank you for, thank you for the praise from Venus tonight, 
that Molly does not have a broken leg and that it's just a soreness from her dislocation that's back in. Father, thank you for that gift. Um, we know it was a very scary wait for that visit and what might be coming. And we thank you for being with Venus and Jeremy and Molly through that situation. We also lift up Cheryl as she's preparing for surgery in a few weeks here. Father, we pray that that surgery would help relieve her symptoms, the numbness and pain she has in her legs. We pray that this surgery would go well, that you would give wisdom as they are planning it, and that you would be with her as she recovers. Father, we continue to lift up our sister Janet. We pray that you would be with her as she's recovering from her broken arm in that surgery. Uh, we thank you for her family members, um, Heather and Charlene and Tyler and so many more who have been there to help her. We thank you for the family friends who have been coming by and their daughter who is giving some help. Um, Father, thank you for that. We lift up our brother Marty to you. Father, we pray for the healing of his heart after his heart attack and his procedure. We pray, Father, that you would help him to regain some strength to be able to stand and walk safely. Father, we also pray that you would be with him. Um, Father, we pray for relief from his anxiety. Being in the hospital has made that a lot worse. And we pray, Father, that you would wrap your arms around him right now and hold him fast. We pray for our sister Faye, Father. Um, again, we thank you for her family members and friends who are there to help talk to her and care for her. We pray for Danny and Marcy as they try to continue to decide the best ways they can help her and, and provide for her. Father, we lift up the Bell family as uh, Tom has been diagnosed with leukemia. We lift up his wife, Courtney, and their children. Father, we pray for physical protection for uh, Tom for healing, and we pray for his whole family as they're dealing with this stress. Father, I lift up myself and my family. Um, Father, thank you for calling us here. Thank you for equipping us. Thank you for this chance we have this week to participate in General Assembly. And uh, I pray that we would come back equipped and refreshed and challenged. Father, we lift up Gina's unspoken um, along with Darlene's unspoken. We also lift up the two young women with cancer we've been praying for and the three families that we've continued to lift up to you, Father. You know their situation. Father, we celebrate baby Troy's first birthday. Thank you, Father, for that wonderful milestone. We pray for continued um, health and safety for him. We pray for the upcoming surgery. And uh, thank you, Father. Thank you for that. We lift up our, our sister Barbara, Father. We pray that you would bring healing to her eye. Father, we know that this has been weighing on her heart for a long time, and we pray that you would bring healing. We also lift up her neighbor who's having this blockage repaired so that he can be eligible for transplant surgery. Father, we know that this is a fragile time for him health-wise, and we pray for full protection for him. We lift up Kay's cousin. We pray that the kidney stones would be broken up and patched, and that her kidneys would um, heal and, and work as normal. We lift up her friend Patty. We pray for her heart, Father, for her breathing, and also for some of the worries that she's facing. We thank you for Jill's new job, Father, and we pray that you would continue to give her wisdom in the new tasks that she's been given. We lift up her friend at the hospital, Father, we pray that he would be without pain and without fear right now and that his heart would be yours. We lift up our brother Rich who had a bad day at work. Father, we know the enemy is trying to trip him up and we pray that you would speak truth into his heart, Father. Yes. Help him to know that he is your child and that he is loved, that you celebrate him. Father, we lift up Daryl. 
um, and Charlene's mom on their trip back. We pray for continued good, um, good fishing for Daryl and his son and that they have some good time together. Father, we lift up the wildfires, the, the homes that are in the path, the people who are evacuating, the, the many, many firefighters who are working to contain and stop these fires. Father, we pray that people would be able to evacuate and, and get to safety away from these fires. We pray for the first responders who are putting themselves at risk. Father, we pray for all of those right now who are struggling with the smoke and the poor air quality. And um, just help us get through this, Father. We can't get through it without you. As, uh, as Sister Monica said, there are many hard things we're dealing with in our world right now. Um, the police violence and mass shootings in our country the natural disasters, the war in Ukraine now where they've blown up a dam and there's so, such terrible flooding um, and, and many more, Father, you, you know. Um, as these things happen, as the waves crash around us, please help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to never look away from you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's right, the Solomons. Please keep praying for them as well. Okay, so are we ready to get back into Daniel? We kind of left on a cliffhanger. Um, we got partway through chapter 2 last week, and um, the king had had a dream, and he called all of the wise men together to interpret the dream, but he added a wrench in the works. What was the extra command he gave? Yeah, he wasn't going to tell them the dream. So they had to tell him what his dream was about and then also interpret what it meant. And uh, now his, his wise man, the, the best of his team, came forward. And what did that guy say? Can't be done. Can't be done. So the king got a little mad and said, you know what? I'm just going to kill all of you. The guard came to get Daniel and his friends. And, of course, Daniel's like, well, uh, what? I didn't do anything. Right? Why are you killing us? And Daniel asks for time. Asks for time. So the king grants the request. Daniel prays, and what happens? He has a, yeah, God speaks to him and tells him. Tells him what the dream is and what it means. So Daniel drops everything and runs right to the king, right? No, what did he do first? He thanked God. He worshiped God. So that's where we finished last week where Daniel had been worshiping God and just celebrating that God had answered the prayers. So tonight, we're going to pick up at verse 24, where Daniel um, is about to interpret the dream. Could someone please read Daniel chapter 2, verses 24 to 28? Thank you, sister. Therefore, Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. who reveals secrets and he has made known dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Thank you. All right. So not quite to the dream, but man, this is a big conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
this is a big deal. Now, just so you know, they had some pretty strict rules back then about who was allowed to be in the presence of the king and some even more strict rules about who was allowed to speak in the presence of the king. So just to be standing there face to face with the king and talking to him back and forth like this, yeah, most people didn't do this. And if they did, they didn't live. Yeah. So Daniel goes to Arioch, who's the kind of manager who has been given the job of executing the wise men. And he speaks, but this time he speaks with authority. Right? He says, do not kill the wise men. Take me to the king. This is a big difference, isn't it? Yes. When they had the whole thing with the vegetables, how did Daniel speak? Yes. Yeah. Could we please try this? Could you give it an attempt? Maybe we, right? It was, it was very much uh, trying to maintain the peace kind of thing. How's he talking now? He's talking like a prophet. God has given him time. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. Now that's going to be one of the big themes with Nebuchadnezzar. There's going to be another dream that comes up later that specifically addresses that. But when we were reading in Ezekiel, you might remember that it says that God gave Nebuchadnezzar the power and authority to attack Jerusalem. It even says that he guided him there. Remember it said that Nebuchadnezzar was at a crossroads and he was deciding to go here or go there and God pointed him towards Jerusalem. So God has been orchestrating these events. Mm -hmm. Now, up to this point, Nebuchadnezzar is not recognizing that. He thinks that he's the one fully in control, that he's winning because he's tough and strong. He's making his choices, right? But he's about to learn some very important things about God and how God works. Is he still praying to God? Is that his prayer? Well, we're going to get to that. That happens towards the end of this chapter. What does it mean that, uh, when it says that Daniel had his vision? Yeah. The mystery was revealed to Daniel and made his vision. Right. Not a dream. Not a dream. So the general difference is that dreams happen when you're asleep, visions happen when you're awake. Okay? That's the general difference. But a vision, so a dream is something that They believed, and, and some people believe today, that all dreams had some kind of meaning. And that if you just have the code book or the decoder ring, people can hear your dreams and tell you what they mean. Okay, that it's, it's your heart speaking or the world speaking or your memory speaking or your past life speaking or whatever. The point of this vision is saying that Daniel prayed to God with his three friends, asked God a specific question. And God gave him, through a supernatural vision, that answer. God showed Daniel what the dream was and then told him what it meant. Like a daydream kind of Yeah, but the difference is a daydream comes from the inside. Yeah. Right. This is more like a, a video message. Right? Yeah. This, is, this is God speaking into Daniel's brain. So Daniel's now speaking with authority. Take me to the king and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. All right, how did Arioch react? He went and brought him to the king. Yeah, I mean, we've caught in the impression here that Arioch doesn't really want to kill all these people, right? He also doesn't want to die. We've heard that these, these servants that are kind of the go-betweens between the king and the wise men, they're kind of in a pinch because if the wise men fail, they get lumped in with the failure. Um, so, didn't have any friends, did he? well, <laughs> he had this reputation as a lot of men of power at that time of being kind of capricious that if he didn't like you, he just killed you. But if he did like you, he could give you the world. He had more riches than anybody. I mean, at this point in history, the kingdom of Babylon is the, the largest, richest, most powerful kingdom that ever was. It had the, a large, strong, organized military. 
It had this system of regional governors and record keeping. It had um, education, right? Stories and learning in a way that really had not happened before this. Um, yeah, but he was also a little bit rotten, right? Because he wanted what he wanted, and if he didn't like it, he killed you. Sure, ruthless would be a good word. He did what he needed to do to get what he wanted. Yeah. So if you were on his good side, it was really good. But if you were on his bad side, well, you didn't last very long. Very bad. So Ariok quickly takes Daniel to the king. He says, I have found one of the captives from Judah who will tell the king the meaning of the dream. All right, why is that significant? Because it turned down and gave them Babylonian names. Yeah. But he still recognizes his identity as a Judean. Yeah. So even though they're calling about the Shazar, they're still saying he's a Judean. Right? Plus, was it one of the Babylonian wise men who got this answer? No. No. I mean, as far as the timeline goes, this war had just happened. These were the brand new kids. They hadn't finished their schooling yet. And his country, Nebuchadnezzar, had just destroyed their country. You know, really whooped up on them hard. Destroyed the city, burned the temple, gouged out the king's eyes, kept, him, kept the king as a trophy. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. He took the king and he murdered the king's family in front of him. And then had the man's eyes gouged out so that that would be the last thing he ever saw. And then instead of killing him, he brought him back to Babylon and made that king sit at his table. So that everybody who ever came and ate with Nebuchadnezzar saw the king there with no eyes as a warning. This is what happens if you mess with me. That's the guy we're dealing with. But now it's one of those prisoners who can do the thing that the king needs and that nobody else can do. Right? God has shown him favor. God has shown him favor. So, he comes in. This is verse 26. What does the king... Now, this is... The king's talking to Daniel, right? So, first of all, that's a big deal. What does the king say to Daniel? Is this true? Right. Is this true? Can you do this? And then Daniel's reply is very interesting. What's the first thing he says? About none of the wise men, or yeah. you know, the magicians from under the yeah. bed could do it. Nobody can do what you but, ask. Right. No person can do what you ask. Right. right. But there is a God in heaven. Capital B. Right. Now, remember, he doesn't say there are gods in the heavens. So he's specific, right? We're talking about Yahweh here. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar um, what will happen in the future. Right? He's shown you the future. And now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. Right? Now, what happens if Daniel's wrong? And probably not quickly, right? He was already sentenced to death, but if you go to the king and say, well, I can do the thing no one can do. My God can do what your God and your men can't do. And you mess up? Ooh. This, is, this is life or death. And, and not just life or death stakes for Daniel, right? If this is wrong, and all the wise men, they all get executed. So the Judeans, but also Lots of people. Who knows how many? But really, Daniel and all of them are under judge's call because even if his vision is true and correct, Nebuchadnezzar can still say there is a witches. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but just as an idea, in a, in a kingdom like this, what kinds of behaviors do you normally see in the middle management people? What are they trying to do all the time? 
Yep. They're trying to climb the ladder, right? So if there's a mistake, are they going to take responsibility for it? No. No. But if anything good happens, what are they going to do? Yep. Look what I have done for you. Yeah. Does Daniel do that? No. Yeah. He says, no, no human can do this. But God can. Exactly. So even though this is a time and a place where I think Daniel would be tempted to claim the glory for himself because it could save him and put him in good, the good graces of the king and protect the people and all that, you could see how in your head it wouldn't take that many steps to justify something like that, right? Well, God, it's good for me, but it's also good for the people. So, we, right? But Daniel doesn't do any of that. He says, no person can do what you ask, but God can. And so now I'm going to tell you what God said. He gives all glory to God. All glory to God. So, also, he made an important point here. Is God interpreting what Nebuchadnezzar was thinking? Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar where the vision came from and why the vision came. So Daniel's saying, King, this, this knowledge, it's about the future, but it doesn't come from you. God gave this to you because he wants you to have it. And because God wants you to have it, he's going to tell you what it means. So when Daniel is not claiming glory for himself and giving glory to God, that's humility on Daniel's part. But he's also poking at the king a little bit. Right? This, this did not come from you, king. This is real important knowledge, but God gave it to you. So it's putting, you know, Daniel's not trying to butter up to the king. But Daniel's also saying God is here and the king is here. And that's not how most of these kings saw themselves. They believed they were like gods on earth. Yeah. So Daniel is, is he's being respectful in one way, but he's also being subversive in another way. He's being very clear that God is God in heaven and Nebuchadnezzar is king on the earth and God tells Nebuchadnezzar what to do. And this is, that, you don't say that to that guy, right? Okay, so let's get into what happened. Can somebody read, oh, not quite yet, but can somebody read verses 29 and 30? I got it. Thank you. Do you, O oh king, as you lay in bed, in thoughts of what would be hereafter, and the revealer of mysteries disclosed to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me because of any wisdom that I have more than any other living being, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Thank you. Now, I don't know if you're thinking this, but I know as I'm reading this, I'm like, dude, get to the point. Yeah. I want to know what the dream's about. That was a lot of words. Yeah, but <laughs> Daniel doesn't jump right into that, right? Uh -uh. He's got to make sure he set things up properly. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what's going to happen. So again, very clearly, this is coming to you from God. Verse 30. Where does Daniel place himself in all this? He is not wiser than anyone else. Right. He said that I'm not here because I'm wise, even though that's his job title, right? Wise man. He's here because God wants the king to understand. Which implies something, right? The king doesn't understand. And the king can't understand without God. Right. That's okay. Again. That's big talk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to go through a big chunk here. Can somebody read 31 to 45? And this will, because I don't really want to break the vision up. So we're just going to read through the whole vision and then we'll talk about the pieces, okay? Okay. 31 to 45. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge, shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold, and its 
chest and arms were silver, its belly and thighs were bronze, its legs were iron, and its feet were a com combination of iron and baked clay. <coughs> As you watched, a rock was cut from the mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of the iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we will tell you, king, what it means, your majesty. You are the greatest of kings. The God of heavens has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom is inferior to yours will rise to take your place. After the kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom, represented by bronze, will rise to rule the, bro rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires. Mm. Just as iron smashes and crush crushes everything it strikes. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron, but while some of the parts it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron and clay do not mix. <coughs> During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain. Though not by human hands that crushed by pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God has shown, was showing the king that what will happen in the future, the dream is true and its meaning is certain. So let's start at the very end. The, end? the dream is true and the meaning is certain. Are dreams always true? No. Is the interpretation of dreams certain? Not usually. And he's taking his life on this, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's go through and walk through it. Um, just as a quick little note here, when we're talking about biblical prophecy, um, one of the things that we have to pay attention to is who was the original audience? What was God saying to them? But then also... Why was this included in scripture and why do we have it? Okay, And this is going to influence how we interpret it. There are going to be some parts of these prophecies as we go through that are prophesied and happened during Daniel's lifetime. right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, there's another dream Nebuchadnezzar has in a little bit. That's prophecy, it happens, and then it's concluded all within the book of Daniel. But then there are other prophecies that are, are more long term, right? So the metals of this statue, what did the different metals represent? Different yeah, like different kingdoms, yeah. Like who's going to be in charge of the world superpowers. And so we're talking like a long period of time for all of these kingdoms to go through. Longer than Daniel's lifetime. Longer than Nebuchadnezzar's lifetime. And well known that all those kingdoms were as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar's was. Well, different too. They're different. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, Daniel tells the dream. Really, the, the dream is not that complicated, right? What does the king see? A statue. All right, so let's start there. He sees 
this massive statue. Um, I'm using the Faith Life Study Bible notes here, just to kind of you know, speak it out my references. I'm not claiming words for, my, for me that aren't. Um, when <coughs> Daniel first describes the statue, he uses a very interesting word. What's the first way he describes the statue? A great statue, mm -hmm. brilliant or extraordinary. Okay. And its appearance was frightening. Okay, so big, shiny statue. Generally, big, shiny statues are kind of cool, right? This one looks kind of silly. But this one is frightening. Which, how has Nebuchadnezzar been behaving about this dream? High priority was getting... Yeah, he was spooked. Yeah. He had this dream. He calls everybody together. you got to interpret this dream, and you got to tell me what it is. Because right. I need to know, and i got to be sure. Like, this wasn't just Daniel. It wasn't just that Daniel was frightened by the statue. This was a frightening vision. Right? This, is, this is scary. High stakes, scary stuff. Okay, so we start to describe the statue. Um, first, we've got the head that's made of fine gold. What does gold generally represent in ancient times? Riches, power, purity, all those things. It's the best, mm -hmm. right? The next section, it's chest and arms were silver. What does silver usually represent? Second, Second best. Gold. Second best, yeah. yeah. It's also a precious metal. It's used for jewelry. It's used to make idols. It's used for currency. It's rare. Poor people might not ever see it in their life, but upper middle class and wealthy people, this, this is what the silver shekel was made out of, right? Okay. Next, we get to the belly and the thighs of the statue, and they were bronze. What do you know about bronze in the ancient world? More common because it was more available. Yeah, and it was used. So, for instance, the ceremonial cups and bowls and utensils from the temple that were confiscated, mm -hmm. they were made of bronze. So it was special, but it also could be utilitarian, yeah. right? So it's it's not the kind of thing you wouldn't you wouldn't waste it or take it for granted, but it was durable enough and able to be worked enough that it was kind of a tool, right? Like it's not the kind of thing you would cook with at your house, but it's the kind of thing they would use in the temple, mm -hmm. right? So think of like you know fancy silver utensils that your grandmother might have had in a hope chest or something. Right? The legs were iron. What was iron used for in the ancient world? Strength. Strength. Iron was more common, but it was difficult to work and refine. Mm -hmm. So they were at a time in history where not all civilizations could use iron, but iron was, man, that, if you had an iron sword and you went up against somebody with a bronze sword, what would happen? You would win. You would win. If you had iron wheels on your chariot and an iron tip on your spear, you would win, mm -hmm. right? So iron, if you had the skill to work it, mm -hmm. it gave you strength and power. It was an advantage. So where gold might represent wealth or maybe even wisdom, iron was about muscle and power, right? Then the feet were a combination of iron and baked What happens, now I don't know if you know this or not, so if you can't answer it, that's okay. What happens to metal if it's cast and it has an inclusion, it has something else mixed in? It doesn't stay together. Yeah, it doesn't stay together, it breaks apart. Yep, you get a weak spot. That's where the crack forms and everything breaks apart. Like, you know, the Titanic was made with iron that had high levels of sulfur. And so it got real brittle, and when it hit that iceberg, Crack like an egg, right? So iron, when it's pure and worked well, is pretty much unbreakable. But if it's not pure, it doesn't matter how well it's worked or how well you can spin that sword, right. it will break. And here it's mixed with gold. 
and it's mixed with clay, not just another metal. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the statue. And then something, we kind of zoom out, and we see something else. Yeah, so the statue's already big, but now we've got a mountain that's even bigger and a large boulder or chunk, like massive, right? We're not talking pebble or baseball. We're talking like a building, okay? It gets cut out of the mountain. What cuts it out of the mountain? Not human hands. Yeah, we don't know. We don't, it doesn't say for sure yet, but not human hands. And what does that rock do? pops it in that clay and iron feet, boom. It explodes and spreads like chaff. So chaff was the little coating on the outside of a kernel of wheat. Kind of like if you ever open a peanut and there's that little paper on the outside. Wheat has that too. Yeah, so when you harvest wheat, they'd throw it up in the air and let it fall and throw it and let it fall, and the wind would blow that little chaff away gone, scattered to the wind. That's what's going to happen to the statue. The gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, like chaff. Does metal blow like chaff? No. Does a giant metal statue blow like chaff? No. No. So this is devastating. But then, not only does that rock destroy the statue, what happens to the rock? Well, it grows, right? Cover the earth. Covers the whole earth. Yeah. So the rock that was taken out of a mountain becomes so big, it covers the entire earth. So I get that's kind of the, the saying of like the biggest big, right? Mm -hmm. Like to them, the earth was the biggest thing they could comprehend, right? They didn't know about a universe or inner you know, light speed travel. For something to be so big it covered the whole earth, it means it's bigger than everything that is. Right? Okay. Does that say so represents God in heaven? We're gonna get there in just a second. The chaff thing reminds me of the golden calf. Sure. Where when Moses destroyed it and they kept beating it and grinding it down and, and made them drink it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna take your idol and turn it into poop. That's what that was. Yeah. I mean it. It's true. <laughs> by, by Moses making them ingest the pieces of that idol, he's taking the thing that they built to worship and physically die. turning it into excrement. Uh -huh. That's what we think of your idol. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So um, back to the statue, though. First test. Nebuchadnezzar said, you've got to tell me what the dream is. How does Daniel do on that test? Perfect. All the details, the metals, the rock, the, it was frightening, everything. He gets it right. Okay? So then Nebuchadnezzar starts, or sorry, Daniel starts telling him what this means. Um, so let's go through. What does the gold head mean? This is verse 36 and 37. Then that which was in it had Nebuchadnezzar and his empire. Yep. That's Nebuchadnezzar. He's the gold, the best. Daniel says, you are the greatest of kings. Now, is Daniel just stroking his ego? No, he is. How did Nebuchadnezzar become the greatest of kings? God. God used him. He was, he was a tool for God. All right. But after Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom's fall, another kingdom's going to rise. And what's that kingdom going to be like? Verse 39. Yeah, inferior. Yep. It's still going to be big and fancy, but it's not going to be gold. It'll be the same inferiority as silver is to gold. Right, exactly. It's 
special, but not, it's not worth as much. And then after that, another kingdom will rise. That'll be the bronze. Mm -hmm. And then, this is verse 40. There will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron. And what will that kingdom do? Smash and crush all previous empires. Just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. Ooh. Right? So it might not be as precious, but man, it has the power. Mm -hmm. It's got the oomph, right? We're going to get into it in a minute, but yes, you are right. Then, that kingdom is going to get all mixed up with other things. Some powerful, some not powerful. And then this rock will hit it and break it. They will not hold together. Then we get to the rock carved out of the mountain. During the reign of those kings, I'm picking up verse 44 here. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be crushed or destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushed to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. So let's get into how people have interpreted these things. We know the rock. That's the eternal kingdom from God, the sprout from the stump of Jesse. We've got some of these other prophecies, right? The gold head, who's that? Yeah, that's Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. So we know that for sure. So now we've got to figure out what all the other parts mean. Now, anytime you're interpreting prophecy, there are going to be people who use different labels. Okay? So I'm going to tell you kind of what I believe, but I'm also going to tell you some other things that people think. And basically, the further you go, the wider the opinions get. Okay? We know that the gold is Nebuchadnezzar. So if we just look through history and look at the series of kingdoms that come, that gives us an idea of, of who might be represented here. So after Nebuchadnezzar's son is conquered, he's conquered by an alliance between the Medes and the Persians. Yep. So Cyrus and Darius, they are going to be mentioned in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And they're going to play a significant role in Ezra and Nehemiah in our continuing study. Right? So I believe, and I think a lot of people believe, that that's what the silver represents. The bronze represents the Greek empire. Okay? Bigger, more prevalent, but not as rich or as powerful. So when Alexander the Great and then later the Greeks were kind of in charge of the known world, they set up city-states. So it was kind of all together, but the regional cities did have their own power. So just like bronze is more prevalent than silver and can get a lot done, but it's not as precious. Okay? Then an iron kingdom comes along that will smash all other kingdoms. What does that bring to mind? Roman the Roman Empire. Right? They go all the way to England, so they hit the Atlantic Ocean. They go all the way around to the Holy Land, down around the corner of the, of the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and through northern Africa. So, they, man, they've got, as far as size goes, they got them. And they have an emperor... And they have organization, and they build roads, and aqueducts, and they have armies, and they smash anything that stands in its way. Okay? They smash anything that stands in its way. Now, as we get to the next part, this is where we, the, the feet and the clay and the timing of the smashing. This is where we get into some more differing opinions. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you kind of two of the options, and then we'll talk about them. 
One option is that the iron and the clay is what happens towards the end of the Roman Empire as it's failing. As the emperors kind of go wacky and are decadent and things rot from the inside. And that the smashing of the feet is the conversion of Constantine. When Constantine becomes Christian and Rome goes from the empire that's persecuting the Christians to being Christian. Okay? Now, that, that's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that the iron and the clay coming back together has not happened yet. That the iron and the clay coming back together is this world superpower that is spoken about in the revelation of John in, in the end times. Right, future Babylon. And that this new Roman Empire, this new empi world empire, is smashed by the second coming of Christ. And that the mountain covering the whole earth is the restoration of creation and God's kingdom you know, coming. Which one do you think is right? Second one? Sounds good, right? Could they both be right? Yeah, we don't know. And we won't know. Huh. Until we know. So, we talked about this idea when we were talking about Ezekiel, right? The coming of the day of the Lord, right? Yeah. And how there are multiple comings of the day of the Lord, right? Like the, the day of the Lord coming when Pharaoh will be snatched out of the Nile like a river beast with a hook in its jaws and will be dashed against the rocks and they'll eat his flesh, right? That's a coming of the day of the Lord, right? But then the final coming of the day of the Lord is actually Jesus on a cloud and we all meet in the air, right? Yeah. So there are comings of the day of the Lord, the kingdom breaking through, days of reckoning for those who are against God and days of blessing for those who are with God. And then there'll be the final day of the Lord that leads to eternal paradise. Now, I fall, amen, right? Amen. I fall on that second side. What do you think, Dorian? In here, uh, it's a little, little, one of their little section things, interpretation yeah. of the statue. And it talks about um, the ten toes. Uh, they're associating it with the ten horns mentioned in. Uh huh. In Revelation. Revelation. Yep. As well now. But again, that gets complicated because some people think that the ten horns represent the emperors of Rome and that the last horn was Nero. Right. So even people who think the ten toes match the ten uh, horns sometimes still carry that back to Rome. That might be on purpose. I think it could very well be that this message has more than one layer of meaning. Right? That Constantine converting and the fall of the Roman Empire due to decadence was God's doing. But also, ultimately, the powers of this world will rise up against Jesus and they will be destroyed. And the, the woman here, too, the fact that chapter 2 does not specifically refer to the number of arms, legs, or toes indicates that caution is needed in this matter. The interpreter Right, so this is what I was saying. We know for a fact the gold head is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Right. And we know that there are a series of kingdoms. But the further we go down that path, the harder it gets to be sure. Now, our identification of the metals, most people fall into that. right? Because that follows the series of kingdoms that occur within biblical times. And right now... Well, we, I guess we can't get into all of this tonight, but that idea of the new world power or the new Babylon that, that Darlene mentioned, this is a repeating theme. In the book of Revelation, Babylon herself is used as a stand-in, as a metaphor for the kingdoms of this world. And Babylon has always stood that role from the Tower of Babel to the whore of Babylon in Revelation. 
from Genesis to Revelation, Babel, Babylon, that kingdom, has represented people striving for power and control, people consuming and killing and stealing in order to be wealthy and powerful. It has always stood for that symbol. So one thing we can be sure of, the metals represent the kingdoms of this world and their attempts to be powerful and strong, like building an idol. And there will be another story about building a statue and pride that is going to come up later. So we're going to be coming back to this vision as we go through Daniel. But like Darlene said, our initial interpretation, a couple things we know, that the final mountain is the kingdom of God, the gold head is Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And as we go, we're going to explore how that fits in. But this is also telling us that that prophecy is for Nebuchadnezzar at his time, teaches him some things, but also teaches us some things. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, that warning is very important, right? That God gives us prophecy for a reason, and if we try to abuse it and use it for things that it wasn't meant to be used for, that's treacherous. Okay? That's that's false prophecy, which leads to death. One example of this, um, it's people who try to say the day and the time that Jesus is returning. Mark chapter 13, very clear. Who knows the day and time of the returning? Only the Father, right? Only the Father. So anytime anybody, for any reason, says Jesus is coming back on this day, you automatically know, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Right? Because Jesus said, y'all ain't going to know. To so anybody who says they know, automatically lying. Now, they could, I mean, they might know they're lying. They might not know they're lying. But th that's not the truth, right? So we don't want to twist prophecy to use it for what we want. We need to use it for what God has given it to us for. Right? So i got to wrap this up because we're late and Jill's not here to kick me. But um, this representation, what Nebuchadnezzar does, his MO, right? I conquer, I kill, I steal, I rape, I destroy, I burn so that I can be all powerful. So that I can have life or death and control over people. I can kill people who don't do what I want. I can make people rich, right? That's one of the dangers of the human heart. And as societies, it's something we do all the time. We just talked about the Spanish conquistadors and what happened in Mexico, right? Do you know that a bunch of those people who came over were Christians? Who came over thinking they were missionaries? But look how it all turned out. They decided they wanted gold and they were going to kill anybody. They were going to turn the people into slaves. They were going to take the land. That's, that's what happened. So we've got to always be careful that we don't do that. And, and the most dangerous thing for us is to think that we need to align ourselves with the powers of the world in order to get done what we need to get done. If we have to compromise ourselves with an ungodly power in order to do the thing that we think is godly, we've already lost the battle. Okay? This comes into play with politics, right? To align yourself with someone who is not godly because aligning yourself with them can help you get done the thing that you want to get done, that's sin. Mm -hmm. Did Daniel need anybody else to save him? No. God did it. We don't need the powers of this world to accomplish the tasks of God. And when we do that, we put ourselves under their control, we worship them, we basically say your power is more important than God. Because I need your power to get God's work done. That's not how God works. Because there is a God in heaven. And he's got full power. And anything he wants done will get done. If he wants us to go to Ken Avenue Apartments, he's going to make us a contact, give us a door code, and give us more food, and then give us another person to pick it up. Right? Right? That's how God works. I'm getting preachy, and I like it. This is so important for us, right? Things like money and manpower and political influence and buildings. 
Ugh. God, God doesn't need any of us. In, in, you know, in Ezekiel, God says, you know, I don't need it. If I need, a, if I, if I need something, am I going to ask you? Right. right? I'm not going to ask you for help. I'm God. Right? He doesn't need us. We get to be a part of his work. Right? Amen. So Daniel, the kid who just attacked her ago, was a prisoner, you know, not even sure what he could eat. Now, at the end, we'll get to this next week, but he goes from bottom of the pile to right up under the king. Right? To the, so the second most influential person in the world is a Judean slave, prisoner of war. Right? It would be more shocking if God hadn't already done it with Joseph, right? But this is what God does. If God wants something done, he makes it happen. We just have to trust him. It also means we have to be patient, right? We always have to give God the glory, and we have to be patient. Right? God didn't give Daniel the answer right away. Daniel had to pray and wait. And then when they got the answer, they praised God before they did anything else. And when he went to the king, he didn't say, look what I have done. Right? right? Pastor Paul Ministries Incorporated. You know, for 1995, you too can receive the blessing that I have received. None of that crap. That's lies. That's the devil. That's the devil. So... Daniel is in the same place we're in. Things are scary. I don't know how they're going to work out. Do I join with the bad guys because it looks like they can take care of things? Or do I stick with God? Do I let the society around me um, control my identity? Or do I keep my identity in God? Right? He's not just a wise man. He's a Judean. And you might call him about the Shazar, but we know he's Daniel. Right? Because he ain't eating your meat. No pork chops for him. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, this is us. This is us. And we shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Yes. Not our strength, not our power, not our wisdom. Read Revelation. There's two giant battles in Revelation. Right? First battle happens. Jesus is on the white horse, the sword coming out of his mouth. All the believers are there, the 144,000. Yay! Who does the fighting? Nobody. Well, that time, just Jesus, right? It's like the opposite of Braveheart. You know in Braveheart, the one guy comes up and he goes, I guess we didn't get dressed up for nothing, right? They did. They got dressed up for nothing. They didn't do anything. <laughs> Jesus wins the battle. Then the second big battle, right? Final match, Jesus and Satan, Christ and Antichrist. Who fights that one? Nobody. God. They're gone. People don't do anything. We show up and we witness. But we don't do anything. That's not what God wants from us. He's not weak. He doesn't need our help moving the bookcase. Right? He calls us to witness his work and be his children. Okay, I'm getting excited. Have I told you that I like studying the Bible? Close in prayer. Uh, which about which part? Uh, no, she might have missed the question because she was. She said she was in the. She had it on in the car, and she said the sound was cutting in and out because she had her cell phone on in the car. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your provision and kindness to Daniel and his friends. Father, thank you that we serve the same God. You are worthy of our praise. Father, you are worthy of our trust and our love. Please, Father, help us to be true to you. Help us to worship you and you alone. Help us to look only to you for our solutions and answers. Father, help us to be your people. Help us not to have our identity twisted by the world around us but help us to stay true yes. to who you have called us and instructed us to be. 
And Father, please help us to share this news. Help us to give a cup to the thirsty and share good news to the brokenhearted. Help us to be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, by the way, Venus agreed with you guys on the second interpretation. So that the clay and iron hasn't happened yet. <laughs>